Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a yes, with XBA training camp, <laughs> but it is actually a um, storytelling camp. <laughs> we have been sitting here for a little while and talking because we have special guests here. Oh, nobody can hear me now, probably anyway. Okay. But um, I'm not XP8 um, family, so I have to uh, protect myself from or protect the young um, ladies and gentlemen here from, from myself. <laughs> but anyhow, um, there is Gina Billings, and she will introduce the three boys uh, who are her teammates in a very interesting situation, especially we have alternates here. Gina, who are they? I think everyone knows who they are. <laughs> we have PK, Matt Davidson, and Craig Gerard. What else am I supposed to say? Um, Craig's here from Arizona to fill in for Matt. Okay. Second time so far. <laughs> but Matt's looking way, way more stronger <laughs> because I, I was here when he got the surgery that day or something like that. Yeah. Are you a human? I was here training and Matt was getting surgery like during that week yeah. and that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it was like, so I showed up this morning and Matt's in here. I was like, am I out? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Not quite ready to jump yet. It's uh, been seven weeks since the surgery and uh, making great progress. Just went on my second two mile run yesterday and I'm doing them running more because I want to make sure I can run out landings if I need to under canopy and that sort of thing. But uh, and help the cardiovascular, but uh, yeah, making great progress. So I'm just out here to cheerlead, basically, and uh, yeah. And uh, Craig, we haven't made a we haven't made a jump with Craig yet, right? So far, you came Not yesterday. This camp. I got I got I got outdone from the airport at about ten thirty last night. So I got all all redirected. Like I I was supposed to fly to Denver and then Denver to here, and so. I got went to Memphis and Atlanta and all that good stuff. I got my bags didn't follow me, so I was worried that I was gonna. I thought we could just have them delivered. They don't do that anymore. They're like they're like, oh, <laughs> they don't we do that anymore. No, and so they're like, we're gonna FedEx them. I'm like, I need them tomorrow. <laughs> you know, they're like, we can do two days, and so I said I'm gonna stay and wait for them. So stay and wait for the bags. So I got got to be here, and so but we knew the weather was gonna be kind of iffy with this. Hurricanes coming. coming. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't made a jump to answer your question no, yet. So. Yeah, and you were so excited because the last time you were here, you said the jumps were so great. You were probably looking forward um, every day to coming back and, and playing with XP8 again. I had time of my life last mm -hmm. last time because it was like it was a dream come true as a really experienced eight way competitor to like walk in and have it. It's going full speed. You know, and so it was awesome, and so I had a great time. And what we have been doing here again in the last two hours, probably or so, was storytelling, and that <laughs> <laughs> it's been a laugh fest. <laughs> and uh, there is a reason behind that because you know it's kind of a, it was a coincidence that this group was here actually, yeah. because a coincidence, but uh, you're all connected to each other in a certain way, right? So it's the old golden nights uh, times which were a big part of the storytelling. And me and Gina were teammates before XB8. She's on XB8 too. That's right, we're like, we're old teammates from way back. <laughs> way back. <laughs> and that was in... We were on Dallas Disturbance together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. in four way? At 16 way. Oh, that was 16 way. Anyway, yeah. Okay. And then PK and Matt and I were yeah, know each other for a long time. <laughs> we're, yeah. We're, but you guys, it's truly like, I, and Gina's been here the whole time too, because she's enjoying the storytelling time too. And so, like, catching up, like, I'm so stoked that it doesn't matter. If we're jumping, it's going to be awesome. But, like, sometimes having a little bit of downtime, it's mm -hmm. so much fun catching up. And it's just a, cracks me up, man, big time. <laughs> And you know, you guys are good storytellers, too. And you have your own stories probably already by now, after two years or with XP8, I guess there are stories to tell already by now. Already. I'm waiting on the really good ones to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't ahead. match the stories of these guys today. <laughs> but you know, like, you can tell it like 10 years, you can actually tell it, it's going to be way more fun, especially when your teammates are around. <laughs> 
by the time I tell your guys' stories, it's going to change into another story whenever it's being told. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, the big story coming up soon because we're doing eight-way competition very soon. You know, the French team is preparing themselves for, for the Cloud Mondial. Mm -hmm. They will do it in October and we're doing this. So, so we'll see where everybody is hopefully soon. Craig and Matt, you go way back. I mean, longer than anybody else in the room here, right? Uh, I think we were actually teammates, like right, right in the beginning. Yeah, like yeah it was, was uh, 1993 I came to the Golden Knights um, uh, tryouts that year. And I think uh, you were, uh, we overlapped a little bit, but you were leaving as I, uh, 94? Yeah, I left in, yeah, 94. Actually, I left like actually February of 95 was my last day of February, like 15th. 95 was my last day in the Army, but 94 was my last year, last full year on the Golden Knights. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, but that was, that was a um, young, young guy coming in. Oh, yeah, for me, it's been really cool because I've always looked yeah. up to this guy here, so it's, uh, you yeah, know, it's cool to, uh, to any time that we get the chance to, you know, sit down and talk, it's it's really cool. I remember last year where uh, when I was with Arizona Airspeed, uh, went out, you know, he had us over for dinner and yeah, we every had night. a great time. And, yeah, every <laughs> night. And, uh, yeah, had a podcast conversation. Yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Yeah, awesome. Then we had like Kurt Eisenbarger was there. Kurt was staying with me. Dan BC was staying with me. Matt was to stay with Nick Henlon, just like five minutes away. And so like Kurt, he was like, hey, you mind if I bring Matt? He's like. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, as you can imagine, it was a, it was a. We have dinner every night and just have a great storytelling time. It was awesome. Yeah. It was and the facilities were different too. You talked about that earlier. The That's facilities right. at the Skydive Rayford or Rayford Parachute Center by then. Well, this was actually in Arizona for the World oh, Cup, and like okay. we were, well, but we were here for. For the nationals here was in Rayford, and so yeah, we we're talking about because Matt remembers this and BK probably remembers this too because Rayford was not this, you know, like right. it was like we were had the team room right here, and it's like it's actually just like this room, but just I think one more over. The other this side. was the style and accuracy room. Yeah, that's right. And so he actually built the RW team room like while we, while I was there, and like that was where we came to work every day, and so like yeah, we didn't. Even, this, because I lived in Rayford and would just drive five minutes here to work and come to work. But this is a totally different place. Yeah, I was on the uh, style and accuracy team. You know, first of this oh, the team room for the first two years that I was on the team. I remember when uh, I think it was Neil Beverly built these lockers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how long he's been here. He's been here for a while. Well, that's like, I want my original locker. <laughs> <laughs> he might be in it. He might be. Yeah, so that's why we stayed. It's actually a good place to do the uh, storytelling because it's one of the oldest places at the drop zone here, probably. Yeah. And then you were talking about outside. You were packing over there, right? Where? Yeah, right there, right. <laughs> where before we had Packers. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you guys, you guys all remember this too. So it's like there was, you know, we were making like eight jumps a day where you're packing for yourself, but that's just, but it was like from eight to four, like jumping was from eight, eight to four. And it was like, seems really long right now. We have Packers and doing 12 jumps and done by, yeah. like, I'm surprised a lot of times, last, last time I was here, like we had 10 jumps done by like 12, 30, yeah. something like that. I was like, I was like, Is, are we done? <laughs> hey man, see you guys tomorrow. Like we walk jumps and go home. I was like, it's really efficient for time. Yeah, like sometimes doing like six in a row or something like that, you know, so it was really good. It was fun. And then you all um, competed against each other too, first thing, uh, when you left yeah. and Matt came in, then you were opponents. Yeah. Well, always good friends. Yeah. Always good friends. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and then BK became opponent too, later on. First it was opponents between Golden Knights and Airspeed. And then now, then it became Golden Knights and XP8, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So Matt and I were together uh, for several years doing four way, and then eight way was uh, on the side, right? We didn't really put a whole lot into eight way, and that's where I first met Craig at 2001 uh, Valentine's meet is where I met Craig and Kirk at the old Airspeed gym that you guys had. I remember we were training in Coolidge 
and we came over like on the Thursday before the Valentine's meeting. That's where I first met Chris. Yeah. And you loved him right away too, yeah, right? Like everybody is. Yeah. Like, He's cool. the yeah, most yeah. beloved person Skyrim on the yeah. planet. Yeah, you can't help but not. <laughs> well, interesting enough is that's where I first met, you know, Kirk. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, we're going back in time here of reading uh, Scott Eyed Mag, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like I knew who Craig and Kirk were uh, just from the articles in Scott Eyed Mag. And I remember meeting Kirk's, uh, he's like, I'm Kirk Barron. I'm like, yeah, I, I know who you are. And I was, but uh, I was like, yeah, it was my introduction really to uh, formation skydiving was at that particular competition. We had some small four-way events, but 2001 was my first year to really do uh, the national side of FS. Yeah, and I just, uh, right after I said something about the sound, I actually team you're on the sound. Yeah, that's what I did for <laughs> my first couple of years on the team, too. Yeah. Yeah. My locker was over there. When there was no <laughs> locker, they were like, hey, you gotta get your, your stuff. There's Gina's locker. So whose who's was that long ago? Oh, I don't remember whose. <laughs> <laughs> well, times were different by then, and then everybody did four-way, eight-way, taking turns, and, and, and so forth, and now... It, we're ending up in in um, in eight way again. Well, you're doing four ways still, Craig, right? Yeah, it's been like two days ago. Like, yeah. So we're we're going up. Um, Eliana and I are doing a player coach team with Dan BC with uh, another uh, our team member Jerry Elliott and uh, Craig Craig O'Brien's a video guy. So we're doing uh, training up for the the nationals, which will be held in Eloy. November 20th, 22nd, so mm -hmm. Tina's going to be there, and so, yeah. Oh, it would be good meet. I think the NSA yeah. audience will be there too. So you're traveling over there, mm -hmm. and Rhythm is going to be there, so that would be a great meet. Yeah. It is like a like an open class um, championship event, as it sounds. Well, it's yeah. billed as an international yeah. thing, so I think they're hoping that people would come because I mean it's going to be November so if you're in Europe it's going to be cold but it, Arizona's the best time like the World Cup was in Eloy in November last year it was amazing so, yeah but traveling is still the biggest issue I guess yeah how, how yeah. do people get there I know that Chimera the British team has plans to go there okay so what everybody will see uh, you know what, what the travel is well how is your traveling to Russia I haven't, I haven't traveled outside of the U.S. all year, and so, but, and, and just to fill everybody in, so in January, uh, I've been working with the Russian eight-way team as their coach for, it was a, originally a three-year project, it was going to finish this year at the World Championship, it, which was all, like, put off till next year, so in January, I was going to meet them in Dubai, and I, usually I fly to L.A., and then I take a a flight over and so when I got to LA I got a call that the sponsor and team member Andre Barabash had broken his leg yeah. on landing and so they kind of canceled the camp and so then COVID hit and so you know it actually kind of worked out perfectly for Andre because he had some six months of recovery and so he right. you know so now he's back up and so the plan is just to start with them probably December and finish up at the, the world championship in in, in, in Siberia. In yeah, Siberia. Together, yeah. But they were training in the meantime so did you uh, get the videos and then did like remote coaching? Or? It, no not so much they would just send me like how the progress was going so because when Andre was out there their alternate is uh, a guy named Alexei Minayev who's like a two-time eight-way world champion and there's multiple eight-way world champions on that team already and so you know, I think they could, with all the travel bans, you know, it's like, yeah. So, like, I think I was more of a bonus more than a, like a super necessity. So, but I, I, I've really enjoyed my time with them. And it's been good. And it's nice to see, like, the competitiveness with, with XP and you know, with the French guys. So, I was really looking forward to it, you know. So, but with all the, I haven't traveled outside. So, I've been just recently. You know, been driving to California since June. That's when we started back up, and so we've made a couple of trips out here. And, yeah, so not 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 so much traveling. So, 
Well, it's a little relief probably too to get this break because your, your vodka com consumption has probably gone down a little bit in, in this year, I guess. So. Well, here, here's the thing with Russians. Like, they drink, they bring vodka to their competitions, but it's like, <laughs> when I'm there, they, they don't drink that much. A lot of those guys don't drink hardly at all. And so they're kind of blowing the whole mystique, you know. And so a lot of times at the meet, it's like bringing out those bottles of vodka. It's like... I don't oh, believe you. You know. You know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know. Like we all know. That's how, that's how we think it, that every day is for them. They're just like. Yeah, well, I guess. <gasps> not in training, I guess. So it's, no. Uh, no. It's a part of the culture. I mean, not in not in any negative way at all. No. It's just a very you know that um, cultural greeting. The ha. Huh, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, if you think German, you're going to have every day's October fest. Right, it's like there you go. walking around with a couple of beer steins around. Kind of reminds me of a story. I remember uh, the director of the hospital over in Russia uh, offered us some shots when we went over there for Larry when he was having his appendix out. That was six of the racism uh, <laughs> championship. Story time. Yeah. yeah. The, it's like the doctor. The doctor. Yeah. No, I did it with him. Yeah. Yeah. I have to. I go right before he goes into surgery on Larry. <laughs> <laughs> now Larry, Larry was in the bed. I think we were just uh, meeting with him up in his office, right? That he had this office with you know this oak paneling and stuff and this and the ad. He had somebody bring out some shots. And chicken wings. And chicken wings. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Gotta eat, gotta eat when you do do shots of vodka. This is one thing that Russians taught me and they're good at it. Like you can't, there's no time, you're just gonna do shots. That never happens in Russia. It's like you have a shot and you have to eat something, whether it's like borscht or some, some kind of a fatty like bacon, something with like grease that can coat your stomach. They're smart, man. Smart. <laughs> because they can drink for extended periods of time, you know, because they're pros. And so like if you coat your, <laughs> that's the truth, man, you coat your, stuff, your stomach with like fat or like some, some kind of, Fat that like, doesn't absorb it. You know? Chicken wings. Chicken. Chicken. Well, this is what he gave right up. It's like it's, it's so rare that you're like just gonna do shot after shot. It never, never happens. Well, it's a bread in Germany. You know, they eat bread when you go to. Yeah. You got pretzels. You know, you eat pretzels and drink beer. Right? Suck up the ham. I can eat a pretzel right now too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn to the French. You know that there's um, they drink too red wine. Do you know you're the, you're the French boy. You I have a lot of. We have two French experts in here now, your French connections, BK. And I was always, um, it was amazing to me when I turned to France for training camps and stuff, there was always a lunch break. Yeah. There was holy, they, they with would wine. stop. With wine. With, with wine. wine. In right. the middle of the day, oh, lunch break, pilots, jumpers, everybody yeah. had lunch yeah. and to drink wine. Yeah. I mean, a little water usually. You just stop. They think the, the train would stop. It was like being on a train, it goes, yep. and gets out, has a little glass of wine, the pilots, everybody. Yeah, and it was holy, sacred. Right. And then you would go back jumping, right? Yeah. Afternoon, you know, the afternoon session. So it wasn't like once you drink a glass of wine, you know, you can't jump anymore. Yeah. Wow. Or, uh, so. <laughs> I remember when I came in the army, there was a, it was a two drink lunch. At the time, you could go to the NCO club and get a two-drink lunch. That's the truth. So I came to the Army in 1983, and then it kind of radically changed right after, not far after that. So it was like, it was at a time when even if the drinking age is 21, Come on in. if you're on a, in a military base, and the drinking age is 18. And so but it's all changed. So, but that's the truth, a two drink lunch. And I think you're driving, this is like a two martini lunch. You guys, you know, you know how strong a martini is? Like, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing about that and I was like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so when you came, BK, was that still the case? No, no, I was never allowed to have any beer at lunch. Yeah. I don't think so, not that I remember. Uh, yeah, I don't think, they, they, at the time there was two drinks, they had categories, whether it was like a light beer or, <laughs> or a double vodka, you know, it's like. I had heard about it, I had like, uh, I had a, uh, an old master sergeant from, he was a Vietnam guy, mm -hmm. you know, and I would hear the stories from him, this is like when I first came in the army, you know, quite a while ago, but it's cool hearing the old stories. It's not that, because BK, you just turned 50, right? Mm -hmm. I just turned 55, so it's like, it's the, that period in there is kind of like, 
within a couple of years, you know, but sometimes I tell that story. It's like, it wasn't like that all the time. Like it happened early on when I came in the military, but it got, got turned down. They got yeah, so switched off. off. <laughs> <laughs> it switched off, but I bet there's some good stories. I bet. <laughs> Storytelling. So how did, how did you handle the French lunch breaks when you uh, started visiting France all the time? Actually, we uh, we didn't do any lunch breaks. The way Hell Week is structured, uh, you know, all my all my trips to France have been uh, at Weenby in the tunnel with Marcel and Damien. Uh, normally, they're so busy that you go from uh, about 8 a.m. is when we start flying, and we stop flying at um, maybe six or seven at night, and then social time, and then. They didn't stop for lunch? No, nope, not at all. No, nope. we went all the way through. Uh, but your story that you were telling uh, about lunch breaks, uh, years ago in Italy, uh, at Verona, uh, some style and accuracy competitions, they would, they would stop everything there for lunch. <laughs> everything was shut down for lunchtime and then start back up. But that's the only time I've ever seen like the full lunch shut down. I think it's a pretty civilized process. I like it. Yeah. Right. Wemby has a bar right there next to the flying chamber. Mm -hmm. yeah. And ed everybody stayed away. Nobody sneaked in there once in a while for a glass <laughs> of wine. I mean, yeah, a lot of French I guys saw a lot of coffees. A lot of coffees. Coffees, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that. But it's a full bar. Full yeah. bar. Yeah, definitely beer in the evening at Wemby. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what are the uh, specifics for the XP8 breakfast, lunch breaks? And oh, there comes the bus, so you can probably tell us. Hey, grab a seat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Cheer, <laughs> Your lunch break is whatever you take in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Shoving bars yeah. in your pocket. Granola bars. Kirk Verona with, without a Golden Knights history, right? I say one more time. Go, so you go yeah. without a golden knife is yeah. yeah, yeah, all all in that mix. Even before I was, uh, you know, a jump run competitor, I followed in parachutist, you know, of course, you know, I was a student of the game, you know, for sure. And the golden knights, I remember them, you know, making a thousand competitive eight way jumps a year and then come in four way and just destroy everybody in four way too with <laughs> no practice, you know, it means something. Yeah, and then you, 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 uh, your time came in 95, right? 94, 94. Yeah, I, I was on the U.S. team in 93, at the U.S., at the World League in 93 in Eloy, and, uh, and then we formed Airspeed in, uh, right after that. And then that, and when Craig came from the Golden Knights to Eloy, then you started the Eloy. Doing Eloy, yeah. So we, we were friends before, like, when I remember you meeting Kirk here, but I actually remember Kirk from, from Oklahoma. He was on a team called the Magnet Men. And they did like of like these guys were weekend guys, but they were the, like the highest performing guys, you know. So it was like like Jack's team, and then the Gold Knight, two Gold Knight teams, and then like the Magnet Men were were in there. Who was on it? That was uh, myself, Sam Johnson, Don Thomas, and uh, Marshall Clark. Yeah, mm -hmm. Don Thomas was uh, uh, the guy that did all the stunt work for Wesley Snipes and Drop Zone. Okay. The magnet man, how'd that magnet. name come in? Because we had that little, we had the little, the little <laughs> magnet board, you know, you do your jumps. We were magnet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. Yeah. But that was like late 80s. That yeah. was like 88, 89, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Last time, last days in Muskogee. Yeah. Remember we used to host Airspeed here, Matt, as, uh, you know, as the Golden Knights, the U.S. teams could come and yeah. train with us. Yeah. So. I remember you being here and Kirk being here, you know, whether it was four way or eight. I came here with when they were doing that. Yeah. That's what we were doing. We trained, yeah. I don't know if they were trained a porter, I yeah. remember, because these the guys, porter, yeah. it was a porter, and I remember I was filling in for somebody. Like, I think I was on the Golden Knights, I did a jump with, with I think it was Kirk or Jack, but yeah. like they, they were training four way here. And like they were training like there was a helicopter here. Like, we're hoping. Yeah, I remember 1995, yeah. I was. Uh, I made the eight-way team at the end of 95, so I think I was still on the style and accuracy team, but you know, we were all training out here at Rayford, and I can remember you guys pulling up. Yeah. I think that was really my, my first introduction to you guys was, you guys pulled up, you had this band, it was like this old 1970s looking yeah, band. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I can't remember if it was brown, but it had these like gold and you know, yeah, red stripes on the outside, a little bubble window on the yeah. side. We were uh, 
Yeah, I remember you guys getting out of that thing coming out of here. Was, that was back in the white jumpsuit days. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were just all sort yeah. of training. Yeah. And we, we were getting in the tunnel, you know, we were getting in the tunnel yeah, for Bragg. Yeah, Bragg tunnel. It yeah. helped us, man. <laughs> oh, let's, let's tell the stories about the white jumpsuits or the other color. I, I don't know many people know at all yeah. that it all started differently with the jumpsuit. It was, for us, like going to Arizona, it was we thought it would be cool or something. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, then we, would, uh, we went to Taft that first summer, super hot Taft as well, and Larry had it out of there. And uh, then we went to the white jumpsuits in there. It just, it didn't you have a purple jumpsuit too? We had purple, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a purple. But it was, it didn't really help with that part of it. They got dirty, you know, but then we went to black for the judging, you know. 2003, you guys were here, so you just the four or two, because mm -hmm. uh, the world meet that year was in Gat. I believe, yeah. yeah. And so it was out of the foyer. Yeah. You guys trying to make it here. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Isn't the SB planning to go back to white jumpsuits? I think I did. I think they said something about it. Didn't right. they say I've heard them talking about it a little bit, but I don't yeah. know how serious they are about yeah. it. Yeah, I was wondering if he was just pulling my arm. I don't or know. Know. Well, at the time, it's like there wasn't as much grass as there is in Eloy right now. <laughs> so, you know, like when you're. Oh. Like, so that's like if you go look at my gear right now, I just trained in Paris, and you know, like they, there's like a, there's an ultralight runway there. There's my favorite thing to land on. Yeah. Like, like as you just slide on it, sometimes the grass in in Paris is uneven. It's super green, but it's uneven. I feel like I'm gonna break my ankle on it, so I don't want to run. Like, and you can't slide; it won't grabs you. So like I was here and find this grass out here, which was amazing yeah. it's like this carpet it's just yeah. like you yeah. know and so I went there and so I've been on that runway and I looked at my gear and it's, I just washed it and I was like it looks it great. looks like someone <laughs> dumped, dumped a whole wheelbarrow of dust on it it's just like horrible and so but Eloy's like that too if you land out yeah. like if you're lying in the grass no problem but if you slide in there or something it's like moon dust I had on a uh, white jumpsuit at 300 where we were telling story time about that I was in a bright white suit for the row I was on in 300 way. and I landed out yeah. and I just saw like a old barbed wire fence out there so I had to do like a last minute turn and dirted myself and I was just hey, doing story time it's like Mr. Rogers and Abraham <laughs> Let's see if we fit them We're in an inspection right now. It's going crazy. I think. So we're actually we're telling we're doing an interview with Kurt. We're telling telling stories. So, but it was like it's like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's oh, it's Scott Rogers. How could you do that? I haven't seen that in a long time. time. <laughs> Mr. Scott Rhodes, by the way, and if anybody doesn't know that yet, he is literally, I mean, correct, correct me or not, but I think, Scott, you are the most successful Edward competitor in history. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tell us. He got more world meets than me. Six in a row. Six anyway world championships in a row. <laughs> in a row. And Matt tries to get close now, right? I'm trying. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he never forgets his roast beef. No, he never forgets roast beef. There's a story to that. Well, exactly. it. yeah. oh, it's story time. So. It is story time. It is story time. So while we're on it, let's let's see if uh, my version matches up. With you. So, uh, we were I was shooting video at the time. This is my first year on the eight way team, and I'm I'm shooting um, video and alternate. So uh, you know, at the time I was I was in the gym quite a bit. And I was trying to gain some weight, and I hadn't realized then yet that that wasn't the you know the kind of physique that you needed for it. So anyway, I'm you know shoving down food, and I'm just constantly eating food. So I had this. Uh, I, you know, go to the deli and get these pounds Pound of half. roast beef of, of, yeah, so the time is roast beef or turkey, so in my jumpsuit, you know, I would, I would take that along, you know, so I'm, I'm jumping camera, and at the time we had the, or the Hi8 cameras or something, and, you know, they'd get this big lithium battery on the, on the back of it, and those batteries wouldn't last very long, so you'd have to carry an extra, and usually I did, well, this time, you know, I think it was, you know, quick in between jumps or something, so I made sure to grab my roast beef, but forgot the battery, so <laughs> You know, this guy could get pretty serious about competition. You know, he demanded the best out of his people. So, as uh, you know, 
as we're up there, you know, it was excellence all the time for Scott. And I remember turning on the camera to test it, and it gives you the little beep, 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 beep. And then it shuts the, the camera off and, you know, shows a no battery sign. And I just uh, go from one to the next. I start, I start sweating. <laughs> This whole time, John Hoover, he's sitting right there next to me. He looks over, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, are you gonna tell Scott? I heard Gary. I heard Gary from the front of the plane going, you have to tell him. <laughs> you have to tell him. I was like, he is gonna kill me. So you know, this, it, it seemed like an eternity in my head, but finally I was like, uh, Scott, I, I uh, forgot the baby. He was like, all right, no big deal. We'll do drill or something. And I was like, wait. What? <laughs> no, I said no big deal, but you didn't forget your roast beef, did you? <laughs> when Gene when Matt was telling this story, he went to go to his pocket, and I thought he was going to grab the roast, roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did. I had the roast beef, but I didn't have my spare battery. Oh, was, my yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the reason, because I took the, you know, the jumpsuit pocket. I just got that one pocket in there, so I grabbed the roast beef and put it in there, but forgot to grab the spare battery. <laughs> That's a situation we were in. There was no video, you know, training jump. So. I was thinking that'd be bad. It'd be awesome if there was just roast beef in there. And so it is true. It is true. It is true. <laughs> well, I didn't know what was going on, but I could hear Carrie back there. You have to tell him. Up <laughs> until that point, yeah, they caught my ear. You, you, have, you have to tell him. And I was like, what? <laughs> I got my roast beef. So now, anytime yeah, he didn't cross that off. That was one of the funnier moments, though. Ooh, that's that's how the whole morning's been. <laughs> yeah, I know. I get I wipe my eyes a lot because it makes me laugh so hard. And I'm so glad I don't have to, you know, anchor anything because it all just goes by itself. <laughs> I guess he's coming the door next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What brings you here, Scott, today? What brings you here today? When he does, I show up. Oh, we have that in common, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but we were peace partners for years. Yeah. Taught me everything I know. That's it. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of origination. Uh, how that Star Wars saying go? The master has become the student. Yeah, yeah. The student yeah, yeah, yeah. the master. The master has become the student. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, a lot of, and actually when I was on Airspeed, like, Scott's still the only coach that we ever brought in to coach Airspeed 8. Like, mm. the oh, only, only guy we ever hired, yeah. They didn't listen to me, huh? Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> hey, one of my... Well, <laughs> <one, one, one, laughs> oh, I do remember one thing. I remember at, at a, the final out brief, I remember telling Airspeed, while you're asleep, the French are training, and I remember Kurt going, I'm never sleeping again. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not sleeping anymore. So what we would do, Kurt, we, we, when Scott would leave, we would get in the team room, and we'd have a whiteboard, and everybody had to list their three, like out of the whole week that Scott was with us, you have to pick your three favorite things that you got from Scott. And so, we, yeah, and so a lot of us, <laughs> it's an awesome story, because you know, Scott, like, the whole time I, I was teammates with him, he was a, a high achiever, you know? It's like, you know, and, and, and like, Airspeed kind of brought in, like, things you like, positivity, and, and Scott was trying to, like, work with us on there, you know? But and Scott was like, he's usually, like, getting right down to, okay, guys, we got to fix this one, this is good, and, like, something like that. <laughs> and so, and, and we were, you know, we just wanted to perform for Scott, man, because, like, he brought, like, we all wanted him to, want to do well for him. And Scott was up there debriefing, and he's like, you know, the jump comes on, and we're like, we're all sitting around like, ah, the jump was not great, man. It's like, Scott's trying to be, like, positive, and he's like, well, you know, well, you know. It's like, you can't find anything. He goes, no, he goes, he goes, well, he goes. It's like, well, you know. We never forgot that because yeah. it was true. Yeah, it's like, do, do you have to read put some more tape in there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking the battery. <laughs> And, and another another one that we all thought was great is like you know like you know Scott like a lot of our favorite things were who Scott is but it's like he was like you never want to get good <laughs> at shaking up because <laughs> like if you're on the podium you know like 
Congrats. And all shake yeah, down. Yeah, you want to get good at like, oh, you guys, really good job. You guys, Thanks hey, for coming hey, out. Awesome <laughs> yeah. That brings us to the French topic, right? You have to hate the, you have to hate your opponent. Is that right? That's the attitude that you need to have to was, towards. We didn't we talk like about? A, it was definitely how how it was thought of for a lot of people. You know, just like because like make people your enemy. You know, it's like. Yep. Yeah. But I think because military guys, that kind of works best. <laughs> you know, I remember being on the the eight way team in the eighties. I mean, the first time I ever competed against the Russian guys, I still had that. I was like. And no, man, it was still like Eagle and the Bear at the time. You know, I was reading like Hunt for Red October <laughs> at the competition. Man, I was just like, it's <laughs> the same guy. It's like, I remember I was a, an aircraft mechanic and we had these threat cards. Like you had these cards, had silhouettes. It was like MIA, like you could see the silhouette. Oh, yeah. Behind these, it was like, you know, just how governments work at the yeah. time, you know? And all of a sudden these Russian guys were so like friendly and happy. Yeah. I was like, kind of cool. Yeah. We were just talking about, though, uh, before we started recording, how, you know, I think BK is mentioning how, uh, you know, you've got a great relationship with the French now and how it's, uh, you know, it's really evolved. Maybe that was kind of an old old way of thinking about things, but, you know, it's gotten a lot better. Yeah, yeah I agree. Everybody's just out to, you know, to be their best and represent their country, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, like Craig, you alluded to, you know, a lot of national pride. Yeah. You know, especially with the big three, the Russians, For sure. you know, the, the French and the Americans in eight way, you know, there's a lot of pride behind everything that yeah. each of us is trying to do. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a uh, big competition here yeah. for all three of us. But the same big three. It's, <laughs> it's the same, same big, big three, three again, yeah. right? No. No. But I think, like, talk about the difference between then and now, it's like that's 30 years you know, or more, but it's like, you know, just how things, just because of exposure, like, when I never really ever spent much time with Russian people, you know, and so, like, and even when I was in the Army, hanging out with the French guys, because they were our main competitors, you know, and so, I, I just had a lot of teammates, like, I was, because I speak French, and, and, like, just wanting to get to, to know them, and I just remember there was, you know, some of my teammates didn't, they were like, well, I remember, like, people were just like, well, why are you hanging out with them, and it's <laughs> like, because I want to go do some boy you know, so I'm just trying to, hang out you know but I think things have developed way more now where it's like the, you know being good sportsmen you know and, and all those guys are it's amazing, amazing the performance sportsmen. goes higher and higher it's tighter and tighter yeah. and the attitude is better and better yeah. Yeah. what's wrong with that no right? it's because I think you understand how hard it is and, and, and actually my, my two favorite medals world meet medals are both silver medals now because like, I, I we had an unbelievable performance and just just barely lost, or you know, in the last round. Both of them were in the last round, and one of them were tied to this day. Was still the same score, and they got awarded. The Russians got awarded it because they had the the highest, the highest number round in like round two or three. Yeah. Two thousand three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, super fun. But like, you know, <clears throat> but to find out how you're going to be as a to celebrate for them for all, like with the Russian guys is the first time or second time they had won and. You know, to see them win is, was unbelievable, especially after they've so many times shaken up to us. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, no. And we talked about we talked about this earlier, but this may become even the tightest and most competitive eight-way competition. I mean, we are expecting the eight-way competition to be more exciting than the four-way competition. Yeah. When is that happening? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, it is for sure. And Scott, you're following that, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you have the the French team is doing really well, and then the you know the Russian team. But it's always been ever even when I competed eighty seven through ninety seven, mm -hmm. it's always been the French and Russian who we were always competing against. It's always been them. Mm -hmm. And I alluded to the last topic with Matt on his podcast about the ninety five French team, and it wasn't so much that we, I don't think we got along with each other. I just think it was it was more of an us and them concept. Because every time we showed up at the world meet, it was like they never associated with us, and we didn't really associate with them. And I think it was just because of the stress of the meet at the time. But I, I also mentioned in Matt's podcast is the only thing now that I'm older. The only thing I don't like about what happened was 
there's 10 French guys that I never really got to know through all those years, through all those teams that were that are probably great people. But it's just the way it was. We just, you know, when we won the gap in 95, it was, whew, mm -hmm. they didn't associate or come around anywhere near us, and we kind of did the same thing other than going to the aircraft, you know, uh, and getting on the airplane together. And especially, like, I think back then they... We were separated, but the last four rounds they put the top teams in, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Order, they kind yeah. of went in reverse order, yeah. so it was always us and them on. You know, we they, we were we I think we were first and they were second, so we ended mm -hmm. up on the plane together. But even on the plane, we didn't. You know, it was like they weren't there and we weren't there. How did that change? Who can somebody put the finger on it? I think airspeed made a big yeah. change in that. Yeah. Socializing, getting closer with the opponents, and. Yeah. yeah, I think he's getting friends. Again, and at that time, people were coming to train in Arizona, you know, and, and like, you know, like they're there training. And, and even like the Russians came here, like the Golden Knights really, like, yeah, we jumped around in 95. They came here and trained in the, in the Fort Bragg tunnel. Like, that's happened kind of earlier on. Like, it wasn't just airspeed, but I, I know it, like, the three of them, like, you kind of, kind of realized after the world opened up, like, after Soviet Union broke up, you know, and, and, uh, the Soviets were looking for, or the right. Russians were looking for some form of help and stuff, you know. And, and you know, from the original story, when I first met them, they were super kind, like uh, sportsmen. Well, know? that's interesting, anyway. Also, because I mean, Gold Knights is a military team, anyway. U.S. Army, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the Russians were most of them military. the early Russian yeah. were military. So oh, wow. we had the Russian and the U.S. military. <laughs> we're not that friendly, I guess, in general. I think it was just a language barrier. I think the governments aren't that friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had a hug by Alexander, but he was 165 pounds. He was pretty frank being an ass. Oh, God! And they are hugging. Yeah. But the same with the French guys. They came here and trained, and, like, you know, I think through that whole period, it just became, we all became very good friends. and and competitors and even during the competition like hoping that they do well like it's not like hoping that they have a bust or something like that it was like wishing because you're gonna you're gonna have to sky up good to beat them you're gonna have to do your best you know that i recently for the first time i heard somebody admit that they were hoping for a bust no that they were happy when an opponent no, no. got busted that was the first time that I heard it from somebody. Yeah. Actually, and it was official. It was an interview by um, that I posted recently from 2003, uh -huh. where Solly admitted that when I don't know when it was at a at a competition, um, I think it was U.S. Nationals, where somebody made a mistake and it turned out for them that he said, "Okay, we were we went to our team room." He said, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> I used to say, if you were wishing the other team to bust. You're already in a bad place. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for the other guy. You're to already up. behind. And That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. If you were wish, I, I, I remember. I think I said it in the podcast too. Mm -hmm. If you were wishing, if you were wishing the other team would bust, you're already in a bad place. So I always, I was always of the impression that if you went into the A-way meet and you just could get them in the first couple rounds. Yeah. And then he maintained the rest of the way. The closer you get, the more that messes with their mind. Yeah. That uh, we only got three rounds left, and we're still six behind. You know, that's hard to come back from, and it's hard to mentally, you know, get that out of the back of your head. I think it's still important to this yeah. very day. I, yeah, I, I think it's well, take the understanding the pace, right? Yeah. So you'll have that a lot with with these scoring systems, where why like, you might if you score twenty one, and they score twenty one. But you're almost at 22, and they're just building 21, and you know in your head, I'm, I'm beating them. I'm beating them on pace. I'm, I'll, I'll pace them 100. percent So if we just keep doing what we're doing. You know, no, irregardless of what the score's saying, we're gonna win this meeting because we're just we're just getting past them every every jump. We're just a little bit past. I still look at that like when we had the the airspeed and rhythm duel here last year at the nationals, and I was looking at the pace. Mm -hmm. Where are they at? Yeah, the scores are this a twenty three to a twenty four, whatever. But it was so close, right? And kind of seeing where where you are and what they're doing, you know. And I agree with Scott, man. Jump on them fast, demoralize them right away, you know, and and then just stay on your your game, you know. 
SmackDown and yeah. UFC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that com confirms it once again that there is a lot of strategy in it right now because I also hear something that, you know, where I have to swallow a few times when I hear that when people say, we never look at the scoreboard, we never, we just do it for ourselves, you know, we, we don't want to know this. Yeah. I hear this and I feel, yeah. you know. We, we actually, we tried that in, uh, in the 96 meet against uh, the Gold Knights in, in, at the ranch. And we had a sports site guy that was with us and he was like, okay, we're just going to, we're not going to look at the score, we're going to stay with the scoreboard, we're just going to, each, each, each round is its own competition, right? And, and we did, and, but, but it didn't matter because you're walking across the drop zone and people are like, hang in there, yeah. man. you'll get them next time. You'll get them. Well, is it bad? Is it, it's bad. It's yeah. even worse because then it comes, why, yeah, what happened? No, no. You know? And we only did that that one time. And they were like, hey, we're going to look at the score at least, you I, know? I think in Chicago, when it was like, I think it was the Golden Knights, it was um, Magic and, and Airspeed, and it was like they weren't judging fast enough. And so yeah. we didn't get the scores out until like round eight, but we didn't know where we were. And mm -hmm. like from that moment on, it, I would, I, if I would have known, and I hate to say this, they think, but you do. If you know somebody gets you, you have to, you have to do something different. Or if you see the judging and their people are getting judges aren't catching stuff, it's like, you know, you have to change your strategy depending on what's going on. And so all of a sudden, I came, I came out, I thought it was going to be us and, and Magic battling it out. We took second and third because the Golden Knights just, just had a couple killer rounds and just took over. And you know, I agree with that. I think you need to, to see scores because you can sometimes find that other gear yeah. that you're looking for that only comes yes. through direct competition yes. with another team. It's a fight. For instance, 2012 uh, World Meet, the French team pushed us to... Uh, a new record average, you know, of what, 22.9? I think it was then. But we wouldn't have done that unless we were had somebody breathing down, yeah, breathing down our neck and it kind of went back and forth, back and forth again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you need competitors in order to push yourself to your and I, I think we high point. That was 91. Remember we heard the French were doing like a 15 and that's when we kind of threw out all, all set set up. stuff. I mean, yeah, but and then I, we we went from doing thirteens to fifteens, like in like, like two okay. weeks or something. You know, yeah. it's like yeah, how things can change. You know, and that was just hearing it at the time that they had gone to like a Moscow Cup. Like we just won the World Meet with a. I know it sounds really low. <laughs> this 1989 thirteen point eight average, but at the time it felt like we were going as fast as we could. And then they came back, and, and these guys went to a Moscow Cup. Like within six months, they were doing like high 15s, which they took the average up two points. And so, and they're like wearing booties. We had, at the time we weren't wearing booties, they had helmets <laughs> and stuff, you know, and so we got booties. <laughs> Almost no, we didn't booties. have booties in 91. We didn't get them until 94. Oh yeah, you're right, 93 we got them. And so, uh, but like the setups, like we used to, to build a Hope Diamond or a donut, we would come into a no contact star mm -hmm. And key it. Same thing with a cat. Like come in and key it, mm -hmm. and it's like, and they go. But it's like something you think is, yeah. and they just eliminate. And then they start doing like vertical hops on like one, two, like something like that, you know. And so they they were very innovative. Man, the French have been they've been very innovative yeah. about a lot of things. Man. Yep. So they're the ones who push this. Yeah. The whole yeah. rotation comes in France. Yeah. yeah. Dude, they're like we actually the conversation that we had this morning, like with with Gina, Matt, and BK, and myself, we're talking about. And I think DK mentioned about strong nationalistic pride with Russians and French and Americans. Like, you know, we're all the same. Yeah, you know, I know we're different, but like, as far as how like a proud, you carry so much nationalistic pride that you're. I mean, there's a form of confidence and aggression that's rare to find, but they're and you know, with, especially with the French, they're big. They make big technology, technological advances in it. Invention. Yeah. Who remembers when the when the French, I think it was the eighth grade team, came with the astronaut jumpsuits? Eighty nine. Eighty seven. Eighty seven. Like I think it was. Well, it was ninety one. Ninety one. Ninety one. When they first had the helmets. Darth Vader. And yeah. They looked, looked intimidating. <laughs> yeah. I was talking. And we beat them by nine points. <laughs> <laughs> but when they, they had their sh their booties were actually sewn into their shoes, yeah. so they put the suit on. And it was a tennis shoe in there. No, the right? suit was a part of it, I believe. No, yeah, it was all oh, one yeah, thing, even the, even the hood. They didn't have mm -hmm. helmets. 
But right. I was talking with a couple of them at the time, and like the guy's out facing, like, here's the hood. And when they looked, like, the hood would stay, and then her head would turn in there, so they're looking at the side of the hood. But they had radio. They didn't have to look because they had Oops. radio. They tried that I, too, right? Yeah. Oh, I heard about the radio thing. And they had a, a video, um, yeah, they had radio with a they judging were, system. Yeah. Yeah. I actually when, asked them, they said they had the key guy, like, you know, Brown there, wasn't it? Or was it the camera no, guy? No, it was the camera guy. The camera guy had a, and they all had beepers, beepers. In, and they were trying to do it, but it wasn't working. Like, you know, it's like it wasn't working as well. But man, they're very innovative guys. Yeah, yeah. Man. They pushed it so, so many times, so advanced it, you know. So um, these guys pushed it in 96. That's what pushed 95 pushed us because we went from an 11.8 average in January to a 19. Five in September. Eleven to nineteen. Well, we lost four guys, and then jumped on that. But then we lost four guys at the end of '95, and had to compete against these monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so that pushed us again, which pushed it up to a twenty-something average in a year, less yeah. than a year. But like, with I think the point is, is without that competitiveness, it's like then you don't have yeah. the motivation to yeah. keep pushing. Yeah, and it's like, and, and to be friends with all that, and like see that that pushing of it it's, you know it's i think it's critical of that you know it's like i i hope that ever that doesn't ever change <laughs> you know i alluded that to like running like if you want to run fast yeah and you're running but you always back down to your comfort pace that you're comfortable with but in order to go faster you've got to maintain that constant mental push to make yourself go faster and that's the same with skydiving. You know, you, you get to a 20, 21 average, that's a comfortable pace, but to go faster, you've got to really keep that push be, so that that faster pace becomes your comfort pace. You know? And it just, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of effort to yeah. push and push. And in addition to that, when you see someone else do it, another team or another person break that barrier, then you know that it's possible as well, and it kind of opens up the floodgates for them. Yeah. That pushing and breaking is difficult because yeah. you have to accept mistakes. You know, because when you're breaking things up, things go wrong. Yeah. But then usually you go, people like to go back to what they know how to do it. That's something we've talked about. It's mm -hmm. like his key guys is not being afraid to make a mistake in order to keep things faster. Yeah. If we keyed comfortably, and we talked about this this morning too, during the story time, yeah. is you just have to, you just have to feel and you just have to see and no, and sometimes take an estimated guess somewhere of all three of those things at once in order to to go faster. But that, that, I was just telling these guys, like we were in here this morning before the, like planning to do eight way. And one of the things that I commented the last camp I was, I did was filling in for Matt, that it was the best eight way I've ever done in my life. And I've done a lot of eight way, but the thing is with, with BK and, and Kirk in there as a key guys, all of the, the team members are exceptional athletes, but they have two guys that are driving it that hard, but not just pushing it to where it's going to break, but finding out. And, and even during that, sometimes you're just pushing it, like it was pushing just to see, and everybody was responding, you know. And the my my biggest takeaway from that whole week was you can't have that. You know, it, it goes both ways. It's like a, a mutual trust. Like if you push and people respond. You know they're going to respond, but you can't push it unless people mm -hmm. are ready to go. And so, you know, I, I came in, these guys have been training for years, you know, and so the the key pace for me was when, when I walked out of here, it's like it's so, it's such a huge deal to have two guys because when you're keying eight way, Kirk's checking this side and BK's checking the other side. But like at that speed, it's like it's more of a feel. It's like as you come in, you got to feel what's going on to be driving it, to driving it together. So it's well, how does it work if they train all year long, you know, hundreds and hundreds of training jumps, and then comes Cratcher out and says, "Well, you know, I'm just gonna fit in there." Yeah. What? Well, how does it work? <laughs> wow, well, well, it was my old slot, you know. But like, it's also like I've been teammates with Kirk in that same slot. Like Kirk was my teammate almost the entire time, whether I was in this center or the other one. And it was, it felt very familiar for me. Cause like, I, I know, I know Kirk's system, even those, these guys have developed even more, but it was very easy to come in and, and maybe be trusted and to be part of it. 
you know. But and you're uh, practice. You're doing four way now. You're familiar with it. It's yeah. not like you're not jumping at well, all. We talked about performing, you know. And Scott, you mentioned it. You you mentioned Craig performing for Scott. Like when you came, uh, just for everybody's understanding, I only made a three hundred way with you, yeah. and a sixteen way. Uh, Hope Diamond. That's the only jump I ever really made with you in my career. And then all of a sudden we're going eight way together. Yeah. And I wanted to perform for you, right? As a yeah. as an outsider to an extent coming in. Yeah. And if I was in your shoes, I would want to perform for these other guys because hey, this is my history and I want to do well for you. Yeah. So in essence, I mean, you elevated us, yeah, you know, d- during that time. And everybody wanted to perform for each other, and that's why I don't think we held nothing back. You know, us to you and you to us, as we just went for it. And if there was a mistake someplace, that was just part of it. But I think uh, just the short time you were here, you elevated this even more, which is, you know, it's it's great. I think importantly, like in a lot of other sports that you watch, but like I I always think about uh, MMA. You see these commentators all the time say, there's a lot of great fighters out there. But when you see a champion, they're on another level, man. It's on a, it's like night and day a little bit, you know? And, and that's the thing you have to remember. That, and what is that? It's, it's, it's your work ethic and your dedication and all those things in time, you know? And so when it's, and you have an environment to come in and step in and, yeah. you know, you, Craig's the most winning guy in the, the, the experience sport. Experience when I yeah. was thinking, uh, yeah. uh, and I can remember an example in 1997 at the uh, World Championships there, uh, it was leading up to it, and I, uh, someone was out. I think someone was struggling. Carry us, and uh, yeah, he put, put, put you in. I remember I was shooting outside video for that one, and uh, just you know, just phenomenal. And just seeing you plug back in there was, you know, a testament uh, to your to your experience and to your talent level. But it goes back to all that yeah. you know, the commitment yeah. and the drive. So, Charlie was out because he got to be my peace partner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Scott was like, hey, what's 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 the fastest jump he has ever did on airspeed? I was like, I said, oh, it's, we did a, a 31 or a 33. It was like this and this. I gave him the sequence. He goes, okay, guys, this is our next sequence. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we did like a 34 or 35 or something. And I was just like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> it's like, he's like, now what's your fastest? <laughs> but like, when I was jumping with, with X speed last time I was here, BK's like, man, you know, I don't know if we've ever done an eight way together. I was like, oh, wow. And so, me and BK, we were doing this this accordion dime, block 14. It's a technical block, you know? And so him and I are doing it for the first time outside, on that, right, you know, B slots. We're both switched to the outside. And me and BK, can we come and do the first one, right? I'm, I'm all keyed up. I'm like, is this thing going fast? And we come in there, and I just see BK. We're like left, left, and BK's like, I don't know what to do this I see BK give me a thumbs up. <laughs> I was like, and I forgot we landed. I was like, I saw that <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Craig. <laughs> but it was like on the first you page. It. it was on the first page. It was just like whatever was. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta give him this story. Oh, yeah. So, so, but, so when Scott and I were teammates, and this is part of the story, because Scott never brain locked. And this is the truth, because he, he, drove it hard and I, and I knew he was hard about not brain locking so it really forced me to rehearse hard because I don't want to disappoint him you know and so Scott it's been a long time and you guys are, and I tell this like of all those years of jumping it's probably less than than, than count of two hands like that's the truth and so there was a there's it's still in there the block eight which is a frisbee right and so Scott and I were switching, and I was I was in the bike pole, and Scott had a brain lock, and he's he's the, the corner guy, which is like a three way donut, and he, he he's on level, and he turns and he looks and he's, what is it? What is it? And I'm like, I, I got my hand on here, I'm like this, I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like okay. <laughs> he's like he's like he's like, he's like he, he looks at it, I'm like I'm looking at him, and he's like, what is that? <laughs> we had frat pads at the time. What is it? And I'm like. Scott and I was going terrible, and I was at the point of the long diamond, and I'm up there thinking, this is a mess, this is going horrible. And I turn around, and I'm looking right at Craig's face, and I'm like, what is it? And I saw the empty slot, I was like, whoop! 
Uh, that was one of the funniest, <laughs> baddest brain I had. Because I turned around and it was like, <laughs> gone. No idea what's going on here. Oh, I would never forget that. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. The B King is telling these well, stories. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. these stories are so fantastic that I sometimes doubt if people believe me. Like if I did, if I tried to tell that story without Scott here, not to these guys, but like to somebody else, they'd probably be like, "That was a complete bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I turned around and I looked at Greg and I was like. It was gone. I had no idea what it was. That's it. <laughs> but he's on level. Like normally, like he'd pop up, he'd like look over, like see what the rest of formation is. So it's like it's it's got me like. And by then you could probably read faces oh, still yeah. easier because you didn't have a helmet. You know, you had so. Is it really oh, looks like I, I, no, I remember like even like Scott and I like even if you had like like Scott's holding onto this wrist like here, even if I had like a little brain lock, just like, just a little something and, and like just something like that and I covered up and I was like he felt it. Even if you just have a wiggle, you know, you're like and like and I was like and, yep. and you kinda it's like the beginning of the jump and you come down and it's like and you